The 1990s was the decade in which I first became aware of and started to learn graphic design. Here are three designers that encouraged me to pursue the field, all of which had careers longer than 10 years, but were doing particularly notable work during the 90s. Paula Cher is one of the best known graphic designers working today. Born in 1948, she's worked with some of the world's biggest corporations, bestowed with every honour in the industry, won every award, even had her own Netflix special. Not many of us can say that. That's in series one of the Abstract series. Definitely recommend you check that out. And she made a name designing record covers at CBS and Atlantic Records. For those too young to remember, vinyl record LP covers were the primary canvas of graphic art in popular culture. So this was a place to be uh, really visible. And from this, she then became a partner at Pentagram in 1991, which is now the world's largest independent design firm. And she has perhaps been best known since then for her brand identity projects for New York's most notable cultural institutions, things like the High Line, this H uh, letter mark, which represents the railway. You can see in some of this early collateral when it was in development, this former elevated rail track through New York City has become a, a linear park, a pathway through the city, ended up becoming New York's most popular tourist attraction at one point probably because it's got a great logo, right? And jazz at Lincoln Center, where incredibly long name, so she put the emphasis on the hero, the jazz part, and you can see some of the collateral and signage as well, or things like the Metropolitan Opera. Everyone just called it Met Opera. So that is the part that was emphasized. And the New York City Ballet, so all these cultural institutions and one of them actually a pro bono project is probably what she's best known for in terms of her work her 25 year association with the public theater and this word mark has been much copied uh, since it first appeared over 25 years ago and apparently paula was uh, flicking through a type specimen book and she noticed all the different widths of the characters and thought hmm that's an interesting graphic solution and it, it became this much copied word mark and this was the inspiration for this whole maximal typographic identity you can see the early sketches here how it might translate into a poster and what's incredible about this as is shared in the book 25 years at the public is that every season has its own look and feel but as it's progressed over two and a half decades it still looks and feels like the public all the way through this maximal typographical style is consistent but each season like this particular year they might limit the color palette to yellow black and white or then they might go for these primary colors on a white background and all these signs, although they do feature the word mark of the public, it's not even necessary. You know what it's for. You can recognize it. This is for Shakespeare in the Park, the famous event that they do every summer, I believe. And as it progresses, they can even change the color scheme. They can change the typeface, but it still looks like the public theater season by season. And uh, this work has uh, become a real uh, touchstone within graphic design. Today, she continues to lead her team from Pentagram's New York office, creating identities. And she's regularly, you know, updating new projects, continuing to work into her 70s. It, big projects, little projects, things like the Windows logo, but also smaller things like this four screen cinema in New York named Quad. And just the simplicity of the solution of the name Quad the idea of a square of four points so these squared letter forms that comprise the word mark and how that's been throughout the cinema used consistently so the screens aren't named one two three four they're named q u a d and the way that lines up uh, with the film titles and times or just the typography around the foyer and how it's all done very elegantly and she's well known for her solutions being a very elegant and very useful uh, for the client. My next pick is Stefan Sagmeister. He was born in 1962 in Austria, but he's worked most of his career in the United States. And he's another designer, uh, famous, or got his, his real start designing album covers. By this time, there was more emphasis on CDs. And this is for the Rolling Stones, Bridges to Babylon. And this is for David Byrne, the Feelings album. And Stefan's artistic approach, his creativity shines through. He 
created these four models, uh, these like figures, t toy figures of David Byrne with four different emotions because the album's called Feelings. And inside the jewel case, there's this interactive element on this guideline, these graphs of different feelings and emotions. And it's this sort of a playful, interesting solution that's more interactive, that encourages to make people think, not just make something pretty, uh, that really marks his career. He's provocative, he's enigmatic, he's hilarious, he's original, and that's led him to also exhibit in galleries all over the world. I was lucky to actually uh, see some of his work in a wing of uh, the Louvre in Paris about 10 years ago. And he really puts himself into the work, like this po event poster, which is not Photoshop. He actually had an intern carve this into his body with a scalpel. That's commitment to promoting a, <laughs> a design event. Uh, but this style, this handwritten style, is one of the things he's known for. So it informs things like this poster, which is uh, used for a Lou Reed album release. And... This mix of handwriting with fonts, the physical with the digital, uh, really marks his work. And he's in that transition because of his age of those designers who were doing a lot more by hand and then uh, having to learn the digital tools. So he, he's continued to, to use that mix and not rely on the computer. And there's a sense of a human hand in a lot of his work. And he shares his point of view, often with simple quotations in typographic experiments. Everything I do always comes back to me on these gloves or these uh, coins. Obsessions make my life worse and my work better. You can see these are all one cent euro coins. The kid's trying to pick the glue off here. It might take them a little while to get any significant amount of money, one cent at a time. But this kind of experiments has been another thing that Stefan is really known for. He takes a sabbatical every few, I think maybe every seven years or so. He takes a whole year off to just experiment, to just try things. And he made the happy film during his uh, sabbaticals and those years off of experimenting of developing new techniques and ideas and approaches then inform the work in the following years. He also did the happy show. Uh, at galleries. I love this interactive element where the gallery viewer has to jump onto the bicycle to drive the dynamo to read the quotation. Actually doing the things I set out to do increases my overall level of satisfaction. I can recommend Stefan's TED Talks too. He'll make you laugh and he'll get you thinking. My final choice is the Designers Republic and is this one designer? It was co-founded by Ian Anderson and Nick Phillips. Here they are in the mid-1980s. It was 1986, I believe, the studio was founded. And they really got going in the 90s. Uh, Ian Anderson became the main figure, the main uh, protagonist. You don't need to look at me so scarily, Ian. It's okay. Um, and I've had the pleasure of kind of, you know, meeting Ian just at events and things like that as an acquaintance and hearing him speak many times. And uh, yeah, he is a rather gruff individual as he appears here, but a brilliant designer. And it really became a collective of designers and they've launched an incredible uh, amount across the UK, different studios, Universal Everything with Matt Pike, really innovative motion studio, uh, human build. And they were known as well for being embedded in the music industry. They did a lot of record covers and also things like this poster. Uh, for uh, nightclubs and that kind of thing. And that was what got me interested in graphic design. I was interested in music before I was interested in graphics. And by going to record shops, uh, I would engage with the CD covers and also with the posters that were up and the flyers that were by the door. And that's what got me interested in graphics. And when I went to university in Sheffield, I often saw the work of this Sheffield-based studio in a lot of the record shops. And you can see in their work, here's the clear influence of uh, modernism, the 1960s and 1970s episodes. We talked about this kind of style. Obviously, we've got this Helvetica-style typeface here and this very ordered modernist design. They're also influenced uh, by things like the 1980s episode, Factory Records, Peter Saville. Sheffield, like Manchester, a post-industrial city. So here we have this industrial uh, vibe coming through uh, into this work. 
and you can see with this range of CD covers that they created for Gatecrasher, the Super Club, all the way through, there's a sense of the identity, the feel, but it's kind of loud, it's bold, it's high contrast, um, it's very ordered at the same time. So there's this kind of, you can see the influences uh, coming through here, but the things are done very elegantly by, whilst being very bold at the same time. And these guys were more like a band than a business. This is when they were asked to do a photo shoot of their studio. They decided to uh, go on a local rooftop and mock up this sort of golf. This photo is called networking. And it's designed to kind of send up the stuffy business community, deals being done on the golf course. And they weren't like that. They were like a band. And they did a lot of work with bands, uh, bands like Pulp, uh, Pop Will Eat Itself, uh, Maloko, I believe, or maybe Rushy Murphy solo stuff, and they were in that world. And they also shared their point of view, like the designers we've talked about. So Ian Anderson says that the London crowd took, took it as like a personal insult that he wouldn't move his now successful studio down to the capital. So he liked to send that up. So he described them as being north of nowhere they didn't have to be defined in relation to L London and you can see the bottom half of the country describes as shandy drinkers which if you're not from the UK you might not quite get the cultural reference of that but he was sharing his point of view and his personality and who he was and he wasn't going to be uh, apologetic about that or uh, fit into a, a corporate box they found this too when the studio became so successful that designers, people interested in visual culture, wanted to buy merch uh, just from the studio. And so they created their own e commerce website, effectively, you know, early version of this in the 90s, thepeoplesbureau.com. So it was the People's Bureau for Consumer Information Global Shopping Channel. And they sent up the whole corporate world. So they created stores that were almost like gallery exhibits. And the whole aesthetic of it was uh, aping this modernist aesthetic that took over corporate America. We talked in the 1970s episode about Vignelli and Unimark and use of Helvetica bowls for every single logo. So think of things like Knoll and American Airlines that um, Vignelli worked on and there's tightly kerned letter forms. Well, here the tracking is <laughs> so negative that all the letter forms are just crashing into each other and it has the feel of that corporate world, but it's it's very ironic. So there was a lot of their, their commentary and by Stefan Stagmeister and the Designs Republic doing this kind of work, it helped them have an outlet to experiment, to share their point of view, but also it helps them attract the kind of clients that they want and, it, and repel the ones that they don't. So whether you chime with this vibe or not, by sharing who you really are, then you're going to attract um, uh, people that are probably going to be a better fit for what you're doing. They were very influenced also by this sort of Japanese maximalism. And it was this combination really of the minimalism of Swiss modernism and the maximalism of the Jap Japanese sort of graphical style uh, mashed together that really defined their style. And they would exhibit and share again, this little big home poster about processed meat or the poster on the far right, work by consumed eye. This was another one of their fake uh, organizations the faux q corporation i'll be careful to say that very slowly i think that's obviously japanese right maybe say that 10 times fast and the p pinnacle perhaps of their work was the wipeout series of games for sony playstation and this was a futuristic racing game and they were kind of like f1 teams in the future in these floating vehicles and as they went through multiple series, we really see this, you know, heavy graphical style uh, coming through. And there's a, a particular vibe to it where it's futuristic um, and they designed livery for every single uh, team within the game, kind of like we'd have with F1 teams today, Ferrari, McLaren, Red Bull. And it's really interesting that they've 
they've taken the time to do that and create this corporate you know image for each team and it really created a whole art direction uh, for the game that has become uh, seminal you know within the industry something people uh, still talk about today who are in that whole world this is a, a later game uh, which was almost like a prequel to Wipeout. I think the name was actually changed from what, what you see here. I think it was Formula Fusion here. But again, uh, we see uh, the, the influences. Uh, we see this modernist approach to almost like corporate identity. These logos, these icon symbols look like they could come uh, from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but also there's this, this futuristic uh, kind of look with this experimental uh, typography. And it really came together in this whole aesthetic. So have you seen the 1960s, 70s and 80s episodes I've been talking about? If not, check them out on the channel. Have a mini little binge on graphic design history. And until next time, happy designing. <laughs>